S obzirom da nam broj učesnika evo još uvijek raste, ja predlažem da sačekamo jednu minutu. Brankice prevodite na BHS engleski. We have some other participants joining us and we'll wait for another minute. Dobro jutro, dame i gospodo. Dobro došli na webinar Poboljšanje kvaliteta zraka, mjere planiranja. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar Improvement of Air Quality. This webinar is taking place within the development of the strategy for environmental strategy for the Federation Bosnia and Herzegovina. The, uh, Republika Srpska and the Bočko district. The development of the strategy is supported by the Kingdom of Sweden. And today we have with us uh, representatives of the embassy and the experts uh, who have been made available for development of this strategy. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide uh, uh, participants information and uh, data about the planning strategies uh, aimed uh, at uh, showing them the best practices uh, in efforts to improve uh, air quality this will contribute to the skills and capacities of the experts who work on and who lead the working groups uh, uh, which developed this strategy. You have received uh, the program and uh, based uh, on this agenda, we will first uh, hear the ambassador, Her Excellency Jokana Strömholz, uh, the ambassador of Sweden. You have the floor, ambassador. Thank you. Uh, I'm um very happy to be here uh, with you this morning uh, to um, introduce uh, this uh, webinar uh, that will provide good examples on how to reduce air pollution from experts in EU member states. For Sweden, environment and climate are top priorities. We want to lead by example, and Sweden has set an ambitious goal to become one of the world's, world's first fossil-free countries um, and to be climate neutral by 2045. And by 2040, all energy used, used in Sweden should be renewable. And uh, to reach these goals, all actors in the Swiss society must contribute proactively uh, to reduce emissions. Uh, cooperation between state, the private sector and civil society is needed, and this is taking place. The climate crisis is an existential threat uh, against all human beings, but also all other life on our planet. Uh, and the climate change and pollution, pollution that destroys our, um, our planet does not stop at borders, as we know. And that is why Sweden is engaging globally, uh, working with others within uh, the EU and the UN to achieve the goals set by the Paris Agreement. And this is also why we work with partners in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, to protect nature and combat climate change. Uh, Sweden is one of the world's uh, biggest donors per capita uh, to most existential uh, multilateral climate funds. And here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we are the largest, largest bilateral donor uh, in the field of environment. Uh, this webinar today is part of a larger project that has as an objective to develop an environmental strategy and plan uh, for uh, the whole of the country, for the whole of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and one aim of the project, among others, is to identif identify key challenges, objectives, and measures to improve air quality uh, in the whole country. 
As you know, Bosnia and Herzegovina has a several decade long problem of air pollution in most uh, of its urban areas. Uh, unfortunately, during the last decade, the situation has become worse, especially in bigger urban areas due to the increased number of people moving to the cities from the rural areas. The air pollution outdoors is often high above prescribed limit, uh, limits, um, and uh, especially during the winter season. According to a survey by the World Health Organization, Bosnia and Herzegovina takes the fifth or sixth place place in the world in terms of death per 100,000 people from consequences caused by the polluted air. And according to the World Bank, um, uh, uh, the World Bank report on air pollution, uh, air pollution management in Bosnia and Herzegovina, every year approximately 3,300 people die pre prematurely uh, because of the consequences of being exposed to, to the air pollution. So this is a, it's a very serious problem in this country. And as we know, the main sources of, um, of pollution are, are uh, heating of houses and transport. Uh, and the heating with, with coal and wood uh, are the, the main problems. And of course, this is due to the fact that uh, a majority of the population cannot afford to, to use um, uh, natural gas or modern equipment for heating. Uh, such as modern stoves or boilers uh, on pellets and heat pumps. Um, and transport uh, results in uh, significant pollution in urban areas due to the old age of vehicles uh, and low level of infrastructure for public transport, as well as alternatives um, uh, such as bike lanes, for example, if, if you don't want to, uh, to use uh, a vehicle uh, to, to transport yourself. Uh, there is legislation in place, uh, but it's not fully uh, compliant with EU directives yet, and the monitoring of air quality is not developed enough. Uh, some parts of the country um, is not covered by uh, measure, uh, measurement stations, uh, and there's no functional system for emission reporting. Uh, and so this means that there is no reliable data on emissions of pollutants, uh, and this is, of course, the very basis we, we know more or less where the, the pollution is coming from but this this needs to be developed and this this is one of the things that sweden is supporting um there are more than 400 uh, stakeholders involved in the development of the strat strategy and action plan um that this um that this uh, project um uh, esap uh, will develop um, and um, they are involved uh, through different uh, working groups, and, and we think that such a uh, such an approach uh, will be um, will, uh, with, with a wide group participating of experts and representative representatives of civil society uh, will create ownership and, and hopefully enable a successful implementation. Uh, and uh, this strategy will. Uh, and, and the plan, of course, when adopted and implemented, would be important for the health uh, of, the, of the population in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but it will also be an important step in terms of um, EU integration. Uh, so, uh, because it will help and, and clearly set out what should be done to reach EU requirements in terms of air quality in the next 10 years. So, um, this project and, and these documents will be extremely important to the country. Uh, and uh, I'm happy that this uh, webinar can be uh, part of a discussion where also uh, good examples uh, from, from other countries can be used. So with those words, I would like to hand over to the experts um, and for us to listen to them. Thank you. Thank you. you. To your Excellency, Ambassador of the of Sweden in Bosnia and Herzegovina, for her introductory remarks, uh, we will proceed in accordance with our program. Now we will hear the introductory presentation and the presentation of, uh, by my colleague uh, Goran Trbic, who is uh, leading the air quality group together with me and before i give the floor to my colleague uh, i will briefly inform you of uh, the agenda we have today and we should work until 11 30 
In the introductory part, we will hear from my colleague, uh, Goran Krbic, uh, what are the challenges in, the, in this uh, area, air quality, and uh, what were the results uh, of uh, the meetings we held with our working group uh, last year. After this, we will hear three presentations from experts uh, who are members of uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute, and then we will have a discussion. We will open discussion. And uh, let me give you uh, instructions regarding this discussion, regarding the, uh, uh, our colleagues from SAE will uh, make their presentations in English, but uh, you have uh, an option translation option and you can select uh, the local language and you can hear simultaneous translation regarding questions uh, you cannot ask questions uh, by asking them aloud, uh, you need to go to Q&A function, and that's where you can send the questions. And you can do so during the presentation also. After that, we will start uh, with discussion. I would kindly ask all the panelists to stick to the time that uh, was allotted to various uh, presentations so as to be able to finish as planned. Now, may I ask my colleague Trbic to brief us of the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Azrudin. Azrudin. Uh, do we have the presentation on the screen? Yes. Thank you. As uh, my colleague Azrudin said, uh, we prepared this presentation based on the situation analysis and the outcomes uh, of the previous uh, working group meeting. It is clear that the quality, air quality in Bosnia and Herzegovina is uh, rather poor and that uh, the pollution is high. The most common reasons uh, uh, is uh, coal burning uh, emissions okay. from the transport and the geography of urban centers uh, surrounded by mountains. And this especially applies during the winter season when the, high, uh, the pollution is high. It's the most polluted towns uh, during winter season are Sarajevo, Banja Luka, Zenica, and, and Billy. Goran, I apologize. Could you just uh, turn on the full screen option, please? Okay, okay. Goran, a slideshow. Slideshow and then. Problem, Moje, you walk, I'll ever not in a slideshow. Pusam, Ali, 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 Ali. Samo, samo malo da... Ok, vidi se. Izvinjam se. Ok, we, we can see it. I apologize. Da li sad... Nije, nije na full screen, da, ali, ali... It's nema... not full screen, but it's ok. We can see it. Ok. Ok, I have slight problems here. I lost it uh, on my computer. Can you see now? Very well. Regarding the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the uh, the Hydrometeorological Institute uh, is the authorized uh, institution for monitoring and uh, of air quality. They control, they measure the pollution on 20 stations. Uh, we uh, have a summary of 2019. We had the exceedances in uh, Zenica and Živinica and the consequences 
concentrations of uh, nitrogen oxide in Sarajevo, concentrations of PM uh, 2.5 and 10 recorded exceedance on all measuring stations. Uh, CO2 is, however, below and the ozone are below the limit values, uh, which is a good news. Regarding Republika Srpska, the Hydrometeorological Institute uh, of Republika Srpska monitors the situation and the worst uh, pollution uh, with the SO2 uh, and the nitrogen dioxide uh, are in broad uh, Ugljevic and Gatsko, PM10 also. And it is good that uh, we did not uh, record uh, any uh, exceedances uh, uh, in the oil refinery, but uh, uh, of benzene, benzene, but uh, we can expect uh, to have uh, some exceedances next year if the situation does not uh, improve. Uh, regarding Bačko, we have a mobile station in uh, the uh, custom free zone uh, and uh, it has equipment for measuring of pollutants uh, it recorded uh, exceedances of pm uh, on several occasions during the year the worst uh, emissions uh, uh, we showed here uh, four uh, major pollutants uh, these are thermal power plants and the concentrations of SO2, uh, we had 272 tons per year and uh, PM 6,000 tons annually. Regarding the objectives uh, in the uh, air quality, uh, the national a uh, plan that was adopted 2015 focuses on these four major uh, thermal power plants and their blocks and the implementation of uh, uh, this uh, national plan uh, should uh, reduce uh, significantly reduced uh, concentrations of pm by 90 percent and the thermal power power plant uh, Ugljevic, uh implemented the the sulfurization system. Regarding uh, uh, the uh, GHG emissions, uh, we uh, developed the first NDC in uh, 1990 with uh, modest ambitions. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, that plan envisage uh, con uh, contribution envisaged even the increase of uh, GHG. Now we are developing the second NDC and with uh, larger ambitions. And we expect uh, reduced uh, uh, a re reduction of 12.8 uh, in uh, unconditional regime and in conditional regime 17 by 5% uh, by 2030. And we can expect further uh, decrease uh, up to 12 megatons of CO2. This is a great ambition, high ambition, and I hope uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina will be able to, to go on. We are also working on the uh, National Energy and Climate Plan, and uh, we have been working on this for more than one year, and currently we are done with the situation analysis, and we expect that this plan be adopted this year, and that these ambitions will be even 
higher than, uh, than in NDC. When it comes to overview of challenges that we defined in last meetings at the state and entity level in the co-district, when it comes to existing infrastructure, and I'm talking about the main challenges, we have to underline that we don't have developed infrastructure for electric vehicles and non-motorized mode of transport, then we have to develop railway transport and we have to build district heating and we have underdeveloped public trans, uh, uh, transport. We have the lack of incentives in that direction. And uh, we have to also focus on community energy. Uh, then another challenge is that the collect energy collectors have not been recognized in the law. How we are going to cancel the uh, incentives for renewables and just focus on community energy. And uh, this is just an overview of the challenges. This is not exhaustive list, and we will add more to it later. When it comes to regulating the market uh, under the overview of challenges, we define that energy system is centralized and monopolized that uh, it is not affordable to have a district heating by all. We have energy poverty, and we need to define the fuel quality and its testing. When it comes to monitoring, which is one of the most important challenges in this document, uh, we clearly define at all administrative levels that we don't have sufficient number of measure, measurement station and we have inadequate network of these stations. We need to improve them through development and strengthening of the capacities of hydro meteorological institutes. Furthermore, uh, the statistics, energy statistics is not developed sufficiently, and then we don't have uh, sufficient awareness of the air quality. When it comes to legislation meeting uh, the commitments that we have based on the membership in energy community and toward EU, we can say that there is non-transparent participation of public in energy projects and planning. Um, then we have to continue with the implementation of NERP and uh, adopted laws on energy efficiency are not uh, implemented and there are no destimulation uh, for the old vehicles. When it comes to urban planning, there is uh, non-plan uh, construction in urban places and there is no remediation plans in the places where the air quality is poor when it comes to emissions. Uh, households and household furnaces are the large polluters. We don't have uh, enough support from the decision makers for reduction of GAG emissions. And we hope that through uh, this project, we are going to improve this element when it comes to interagency cooperation. Issues regarding climate uh, changes are not well integrated into sectoral policies. We also defined the general recommendations so that we could uh, supplement and amend them later on. These are ones that are most important. First one is to accelerate and meet the existing objectives on reduction of the emissions from the large combustion uh, plants. And the second one is to strengthen the capacities of the institutions responsible for the air quality. And I underline that this especially refers to the entity hydrometeorological institutes because they monitor air quality and the climate monitoring. And that we uh, clearly define and quantify objectives for 2030, as said in NDC, that will be sufficiently ambitious and comparable with the EU objectives, but at the same time realistic and implementable. 
also we need to adopt the laws on climate change in line with the constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina already started drafting this law, and uh, Republika Srpska started with drafting of this law, and we accept the same at the state level. We need to uh, improve the legislation framework for renewables and introduce new incentive mechanism for renewables. And uh, we need to introduce stimulation for uh, its implementation. And we need to uh, draft a plan, generate a plan for the gradual reduction of the GAG emissions. And um, uh, we need to uh, prepare for the um, entry into ETS. This is what we prepared. We are here for any questions. And of course, and as I said at the beginning, this is a participatory approach, which means that you are welcome and encouraged to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Goran. You raised to challenge to present everything within 10 minutes because this issue in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it is, uh, it is impossible to cover in 10 minutes, but you managed to do it. If something was left out, you can use Q&A and pose questions or say something about the presentation you heard. And I hope that this will also encourage questions from you. The next presentation is the preparation of the plan for improvement of air quality. Eleni uh, Mikalopoulou from SEI will address us. She is a part of the institute dealing with the air quality. And I will have to say that she has a great experience in the region. So I believe that um, everyone will find uh, what, uh, interesting what Elaine has to say. Elaine? Hvala. Uh, dobro utro. Uh, drage kolege, eh, hvala vam na pozivu i što ste danas uh, ovdje. Uh, divno je biti danas s vama i imati priliku razgovarati o pitanjima oko zagradzenja zraka i kreiranja politika. Dear colleagues, thank you um, for listening to me. It is great to be uh, here with you today and be able to share this topic with you. Um, I will, I will uh, carry on with the rest of the presentation in English. Uh, because I don't think it will be easy for me to, to do that. Um, I'm sorry, I think my slides have changed. Okay, so um, something I will be talking about today is uh, planning on action to reduce air pollutants, uh, air pollution and emissions. The, this is the outline of the presentation and I think these are some key issues that it's good to, to have in mind as I go through the slides. I will be talking a little bit briefly about um, SEI and the work that we do, the experience we have with air pollution. But after that introductory slide, what I would like to go through with you today is talk about air pollution and climate, uh, issues in developing um, air pollution policy. This is something that it needs to be very much at the front of the discussion. Uh, how to develop a practical approach to managing air pollution, assessing emissions from key sectors. Uh, I will give some specific examples regarding transport and the residential sector, policies and strategies to implement the mitigation measures. But I would also like to give some country specific examples. Um, and excellent. So, the, the Stockholm Environment Institute is an international research and policy organization that uh, tackles environment and development challenges. Um, SEI has its quarters in Sweden, but there are centers in the UK, the US, Thailand, Kenya, Estonia, and Colombia. Myself, I'm from the SEI part of the University of York, and within SEI York, we are the Air Quality, Climate, and Environmental Change Group. Our work focuses on air pollution and climate change, but we also work quite a lot on combining mitigation and adaptation analysis with a focus on uh, scenario development. 
the the slide that you, you are looking at is um, is showing the the countries that we work with. SCI at the University of York is part of the, the CCAC coalition, and this is the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. And the the kind of project, the initiative that we work under when we engage with the countries is called the SNAP initiative, and this is the supporting national action and planning of short-lived climate pollutant um, initiative. I think it is it is important to say that these are only, I think that this is um, not a too recent slide, so these are only some of the countries that we are working with. And I think, uh, picking on something that Goran said, it's, it's very important to highlight that we work together with national experts from those countries. Hopefully I will have a chance to, to go back to the way we work with the countries at a later slide. The, so the kind of work that we do is we work with uh, local experts and national experts to develop integrated air quality and climate planning. Sometimes we use that, we, sometimes we do that uh, using a specific tool which we refer to as the model LEAP IBC. And LEAP IBC stands for Low Emissions Analysis Platform integrated benefits calculator and um, yes as you can see there is a wide range of countries that uh, we have been working with over the last years the part of the work that we do uh, both SCI and the CCC secretariat is often used to provide uh, to provide guidance and support the enhancement of the NDCs especially when it comes to integrating air pollution into uh, national plans. I have been very lucky to participate in some of that work that we have done recently. And I must say that it has been an exceptionally interesting process. It has been amazing to see how, how this can work in different national contexts. And it's always interesting to see the, the different limitations and how these can be lifted in every uh, situation. As I said in as I said in the beginning, it's it's always nice to think of the limitations and the the issues of a problem quite far ahead in time. So while air pollution is is a very important issue, and of course we will talk about the the impacts in the next slide, but because of its effect on, on human health food security, but also the environmental impacts that it can have, there are a lot of countries that are now um, putting it explicitly into their plans, into their strategies and policies, and they aim to, to tackle and, and alleviate those the, the impacts. However, the formulation of the air quality policies is often complicated by the multiple species that are grouped together under the term air pollution. The, the spatial scale on which uh, air pollution, uh, air pollutants uh, can cause their impacts. So for example, we heard from um, Ambassador Storkmist as well about the uh, how it does not confine itself to borders. So there are long range transport issues. Um, there are air quality issues related to specific localities and characteristics of the neighborhood of the city. And then there is the national and then the regional scale that we must take into consideration. There is a large number of source sectors as well. And in, in the analysis that I will show you in, in the next slides, you will see that the, the different sectors that are responsible for some pollutants or greenhouse gases, they can also be broken down into different subsectors. So sometimes we, we can end up with quite a, a complicated and large uh, system that we need to, to tackle and deal with. However, because there are these, um, complexities and because the analysis can become so difficult there are a level there are a variety of strategies and approaches that have been adopted in order to develop air quality plans and policies in different parts of the world i i don't want to um, tire you with something that you all probably already know however the, it is always important to highlight that there are strong linkages between air quality and climate pollution and climate change apologies the, the sources can be common, the, the impacts can be common. So when we are looking into air pollution and when we are looking into climate change, they, are often, they can often be considered as different levels of one same problem, one same challenge that we have to deal with. 
the in terms of pollutants and and their impacts the biggest policy driver is always the impact air pollution has on health um, the next slide has some uh, more specifics on health however there are also impacts on the environment related to crop yields biodiversity um, there are impacts on the economy uh, on labor productivity tourism crop losses but there are also other impacts like uh, lost school days damage to cultural monuments um, I'm, I'm Greek, uh, I come from Athens, and the damage to cultural monuments, I remember from when I was younger, in the 90s, it was one of the key issues that was highlighted in the news, that um, the, the cultural heritage was very much in danger because of our air pollution issues. The, there is an interesting point to, to highlight here, that the impacts are not just separated from each other, so you don't just have the impact of the key pollutants to health. If the economy is impacted, and as we saw with COVID, for example, you will have a, a second layer of impacts going back to health. So the, the impacts themselves are interacting and overlapping. In terms of the key pollutants, when we're talking about health, we often focus on, on uh, particulate matter, uh, specifically PM 2.5. We focus on ozone and um, nitrogen dioxide. Uh, but I will, I will change the slide so that I don't run out of time. Um, Goran said that uh, we, we, we need to consider the participatory approach, and he did mention the word part participatory um, several times. So this is a very important point. It is always important to express what we can gain from reducing air pollution in, in the different ways that people can relate to that. So air pollution and air pollutants, greenhouse gases and SLCPs, they are not just an academic issue. They're not just a theoretical issue. So it, they need to be expressed in a way that we can all understand how much they can impact our lives and our health. So these are some of the, the health-related impacts, for example, the, and, and these are impacts that go above and beyond the premature mortality that is recorded in the different areas based on the, the level of pollution. So we're looking at um, a relationship between preterm uh, births and PM 2.5, low birth weight, uh, childhood pneumonia, asthma emergency room visits, non-fatal heart attacks, strokes, bronchitis. And these also relate to the impacts that we saw before, both on the economy and the general well-being of the population, of course. So in order to develop a practical approach, when we, when we, sometimes, when we say the word measure, an air pollution measure, we refer to a very particular action that can be implemented in a particular source um, uh, or sector to reduce air pollutant emissions from the specific source. Based on international and national assessments, there is a large body of evidence that has identified relevant air pollutant mitigation measures, which I will be show you, showing you in some um, tables in a few minutes. However, it is very important to map, understand, and consider the local context, the local needs and priorities. And this includes um, the sort of development, the, and even it includes the, the wider discussion that the different stakeholders can have with each other. The, the development of this practical approach can be summarized. I, I, I do apologize. I know these are quite a lot of bullet points and it's very early in the morning. So the, the goals and desires and targets are need to be specified and need to be specified quite clearly. Understanding the information related to air pollution and which air pollutants are important and key and how we can quantify emissions from each source is also extremely important. We need to develop uh, scenarios to understand how the sectors and their emissions are likely to change into the future. There is one more slide about that. And we also need to develop an understanding of how emissions link to pollution levels in cities, but also the country as a whole. Understand, to understand the levels of, of impacts caused is also another important point. We need to identify the measures that can, cause, that can reduce the emissions, and we need to quantify as far as possible the multiple benefits. And if it is um, 
if it is possible, we need to identify the integrated benefits. Finally, again, a very important point, we need to identify all the relevant stakeholders and engage with those stakeholders early in the process. When we are um, talking about policy making, we do need to consider, again, uh, the different contexts. We need to consider the national contexts, but we also need to consider uh, international contexts. Uh, things like the, uh, the LERTAP Convention, the EU air quality policy, EU climate policy, UNFCCC. This is all uh, very important. Uh, it's a very important part of this discussion and this dialogue and this consideration. Uh, this is the air quality management cycle, and it shows how the, the key activities, um, it shows those key activities that we can use to develop a practical approach. The, the goals that need to be set, as, we, as it was shown in the previous slide, the identifying the emissions from the contributing sources and hopefully uh, quantifying those emissions, um, the amount of emission reduction needs to be agreed to achieve goals, this can be done in, in different ways. This can be something that is discussed between the experts. Then we move on to the planning, the strategies and policies that need to be put in place. And finally, um, there needs to be some sort of monitoring of, of the progress that is made. So I must say that um, this is one of my, my favorite slides. And, and the reason why it's one of my favorite slides is because I've uh, seen how well it can work when we are working together with the different countries. The, the type of approach that we take is that uh, when we are um, uh, looking into the different assessments, when we are working with the countries to, pro to produce the different reports, we, we take a very specific approach. And this is to start by seeing the data that is available and identifying base year and historical data. Um, in some cases, we do that through reviewing um, uh, high-level documents, so it can be uh, World Bank documents or, or other um, very high-level reports. Uh, sometimes there are national documents that can provide us with this type of information. And then what I find the most exciting in this process is that we move on to establishing the baseline scenarios. And then finally, we move to considering the mitigation options. I have, there is a very specific example on, on work that we did with Serbia that I will be showing you um, in a moment. But what I found very useful about this structure is that it provides this very solid plan and, and way forward. It helps, it helps map the priorities, the different levels of the problem, uh, the sectors, and the way this can be projected into the future can be used in, in quite a lot of different ways. The, this slide that relates to the, the transport sector is, is one of those, um, is one of the tables that um, measures specific to the transport sector um, are applied globally. So this is just a compilation of measures that have been found to work uh, when it comes to reducing emissions from the transport sector. Uh, we can see that the, the sector is broken down into emitting subsectors. So for example, passenger transport, road freight, and then the main pollutants are identified, end of pipe measures, but also changes in technology, practices, and, and fuel shift, and measures affecting uh, demand for the polluting activity. The, there are quite a lot of these tables and uh, this one has um, more sectors included in this. It, it also has the residential sector, the, the industry and agriculture. Of course, these are not sectors that are relevant to every country that we work with, but uh, for, for the majority, for, for the most part, um, Yes, the, we always go back to these tables and apply them in the, the national context in collaboration with the national experts, of course. Um, just one more slide on the same issue, just to extend it to, to show the, the waste management uh, and, and the waste sector as well. I think 
I've got very few slides left. So in terms of uh, policies to implement measures, these can be grouped under five categories. We have the regu regulatory approaches, we have the planning approaches, um, informational approaches to increase awareness, economic or market-driven approaches, and then there are the voluntary approaches. And I'm sure that you can understand that these are re relevant to one or more stakeholders um, and anyone who engages with this type of discussion. Uh, when it comes to the regulatory approaches, and again, I please accept my apologies for the busy slide. The, the approach includes uh, rules or standards to define allowable levels of emissions. And um, a typical example of that is the emission standards that there are for vehicles. The economic or market-driven approaches, a typical example of those is an emissions trading scheme. When it comes to the planning approaches, we, we often see things like transport-oriented uh, urban planning that reduces travel activity and distances travel. There is one more slide on that. And then we, uh, we look at the informational approaches to increase awareness. This can be done in quite a lot of different ways by disseminating information to the public in easily accessible formats or by looking into different types of uh, behavior chains or anything that can, that can generate the momentum to, to drive change forward uh, on, on a different uh, level. Finally, we have, of course, the voluntary approaches, which typically involve the uh, different agreements between uh, private companies or industry association or, or even uh, government agencies. It's, it's always useful to consider the different implementation pathways that would need to be adopted and that would lead to implementation of specific um, measures and thus reduce the different emissions. And this is the, um, the slide I, I will be showing you in a moment on uh, Serbia. The implementation is facilitated by the different policies that can be used to promote these measures, which was outlined uh, briefly in the previous section. But I, I really want to highlight again that something that is very important to consider are the organizational aspects in terms of the implementation pathways and the intersectoral and cross-institutional collaboration and ways forward. Very often when we are working with, with a country, we find that we have to um, involve uh, quite a lot of um, ministries, quite a lot of institutions. And, and this is very interesting because you can draw information uh, from, from lots of different places and then your planning and the way forward, it always becomes um, easier. So the, the work that we've done with the, the Serbian experts was around the, their assessment of short-lived climate pollutant um, mitigation. And what I would like to show you here is that uh, the, we worked with, their, with data from their LERTAP convention submission. But what is very interesting to see is that when we are using this approach and when the, the sectors and the sources are broken down in this way, there can be a very clear understanding of the key sources and the key sectors and the key pollutants. What I found, again, extremely interesting and um, extremely useful um, to, to work with as part of the work with the, with the Serbian experts was putting together this matrix, the, the mitigation matrix, with the, with the national priorities, uh, with the, the different prior, prioritization levels, the different implementation of policies, and the administrative barriers um, that the, the experts wanted to put forward and present as part of the discussion. I think that... Um, this slide shows how the, the previous slides that were a bit more general can be, can be implemented on a, on a country-specific example and country-specific case. Um, hopefully, the, this type of approach, as you can see, that it has a, a time horizon from 2020 to 2050. This can allow um, for, for monitoring, monitoring the, the impact, the progress, um, even the change in the national plans and the national priorities. I have one more slide, and I think this is my last one, because uh, the, no, that, that is not my last slide, I do apologize. But we often talk about the integrated policies, and there was something that happened very recently in Athens that I found 
very interesting myself. So the, the mayor of Athens, uh, they, uh, he rolled out a project that was called the Great Walk of Athens. And while it was not specific to addressing air pollution, Athens does have quite a lot of air pollution coming predominantly from the transport sector. So the, the Great Walk was a plan to pedestrianize a big part of the city, to change some of the bus routes, um, to change the habits and the behavior of the um, of the citizens in the in the center of Athens, and that uh, the the Great Walk also came with a budget attached to it. Of course, it was quite a lot of it was a big investment. However, a few uh, weeks after it was implemented and everything was put in place and the pedestrianization had happened, there were quite a lot of problems that became obvious in Athens. Um, the traffic was uh, uh, the congestion of traffic was just moved to other points of the city. There were quite a lot of difficulties with the buses, with the bus routes, and it created an, an overall negative sentiment, this, despite the fact that it looked very nice. The, you know, there was quite a lot of green and in, in the center of Athens, we don't have that. But so while it was, and eventually it had to be removed. So the entire project was rolled out and then had to be removed. So when, now I think of the word integrated and, and measure and policy and mitigation option, I always go back to what happened with the, the Great Walk of Athens. It was a fantastic idea. It could have made the, the center of Athens look amazing. This could have contributed to the tourism, to um, uh, the, the development of the city. But because of the, because it was not, part of a greater strategy, of a greater plan, this created quite a lot of problems very, very fast. Um, sorry for interruption, but please try to finish short. Yes, uh, I will skip this slide I... and I will just move to that final one. Um, just to say that by working in this way with the countries that we work with, we um, there is a lot of opportunities to increase the mitigation ambition. And I think this is something that uh, Goran also mentioned. And I will uh, finish with this slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Hvala, hvala Eleni za presentaciju. Thank you, Eleni, for your presentation of which discussed the approach to the improvement of air quality. And uh, especially, thank you very much for this very specific pro uh, issues and uh, problems. Uh, we are lagging behind some 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, I would kindly ask the other two panelists to stick to uh, the time they have uh, given. The next uh, presentation is the uh, improve, improvement of air quality and prevention of emissions uh, experience uh, from Estonia. I call our panelist, Lori Tamniste, who has a huge experience in this area to present this topic. You have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. And hopefully it will work. Um, so thank you for inviting me and uh, listening, uh, listening to the, your experience and the previous presentations, I feel there's so many similarities. It, the story is really familiar to me. I, I think Estonia has gone, started from with the same problems and undergone, uh, um, I think, a long and interesting uh, story of transition. And I will try to share some of the lessons learned from that kind of our journey in, in improving air quality and curbing the emissions. So how did it all start? Next slide, please. So in 1991, Estonia marks this year, the 30 years of regaining the independence after collapse of Soviet Union. And we started out with huge environmental problems and legacy of pollution from Soviet time. So we had air pollution from Soviet style heavy industries. Next slide. We had one of the most CO2 intensive energy sectors in the whole world, because uh, perhaps people don't know it, but Estonia uses 
and uh, used and still uses a little bit a uh, local oil shale. It's a fossil rock, which is even dirtier than coal. So burning oil shale uh, and producing electricity and oil shale oil, it's even dirtier than using coal. And, and we had huge uh, whole national energy infrastructure built on that fossil. Uh, next. But it wasn't only air quality. We had, you know, environmental problems in, in all sectors. We had a huge, for example, uh, legacy of, of Soviet military pollution. So uh, Russia had military bases in Estonia and there was no environmental standards. Everything was going straight into the nature. So there was, you know, every possible pollution type you can think of, we had it, and in big quantities. Next slide. And also we had, you know, problems with has, uh, hazardous waste, and we had, you know, also a nuclear submarine base in Estonia and, and nuclear waste issues. So really, really difficult position to start in 1991. Next. Uh, and uh, the, the waste system, you know, it, it wasn't, functioning, similarly like air, poli air pollution kind of management systems. Next one. But how is it going now, 30 years later? Next. This is, uh, 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 no, one back, please. So how, how is it going now? And although the numbers are really small on the screen perhaps, uh, what is the message is that compared to 1990, uh, by 2018, in most of whether we are looking at the NOx or whether we are looking at the sulfur dioxide, whether we are looking at uh, fine particles, whether we are looking at black carbon, actually, in most of those areas, there has been a drop of 60%, 64%, 53%, 45%, and so on. So a really significant drop in, in major air pollutants, next one. And also the, the greenhouse gas emissions have dropped. And, and even more recently, 2019, there was a significant drop in, in CO2 emissions. And in 2020, even further uh, reductions in CO2 emissions, which were related very much to European emission trading system and the CO2 price increasing in that European system. So all these, these trends have been going on. And, and very importantly, share of renewable energy has been growing as well, uh, very much. So mostly the fastest growth has, has been in wind energy, but also biomass energy. Uh, we have combined heat and power plants in all of the major cities. So it's providing district heating, but also producing electricity. And 2020, we had a record growth in solar panels. I think more than 300 megawatts of solar panels were installed in Estonia. So, and, and what is now the result of it is that mostly the air quality is good. Not always, uh, not in all uh, cities, especially Tallinn, which is the capital city, biggest city, and closer to these. Uh, uh, oil shale areas in northeastern part of Estonia, there are times and periods and regions where you have air quality being uh, either moderate or bad. But, but overall, you would say still that there has been a significant improvement. And very often, I remember the Estonian debate, you know, all the environmental standards, or they will somehow, you know, uh, hinder the economic growth and we should, you know, get rich first, and then let's talk about the environment. Uh, so probably you have the similar debate. So the answer, was it at the expense of economy? The short answer is no, actually it wasn't. Next slide. If you look at uh, all the kind of critical numbers, then actually there has been, in addition to this environmental transformation, there has been also economic transformation. So the GDP growth has been very fast. There has been clearly, of course, there was the 2008 global economic downturn. But if you look, then really the GDP kind of from the 6,000 something 
uh, euro level to more than 20,000 euro per capita. Or if you look at the average wage, which is in the middle of the small graph, it's, we started the national average wage was below 200 euros in 1990. Now it's more than two, uh, 1,400. So, and Estonia ranks number one in the tax competitiveness index in the world. If you look at the e-government solutions, different technological kind of rankings, Estonia again ranks really high. So it has been overall kind of transformation story. But what have been the key drivers to this success? Next one. So yes, one part is clearly the economic restructuring. Uh, I mean, the, the big inefficient uh, Soviet style industries, very many of them, you know, collapsed or phased out or had to reinvest into new technologies, better technologies, find new markets, new competitive niches. Then also there was a huge uh, uh, decrease in the agriculture sector and very big increase in kind of knowledge intensive services. Estonia is now very strong and you know very digital. We have IT companies which are uh, export oriented, working globally, attracting foreign investment. This is all part of it, kind of changing the economic structure into cleaner, more innovative, knowledge intensive sectors as well. And, and definitely this is, uh, uh, I think, an uh, issue or, or, or challenge for, for, for your country uh, that not only to deal with the current environmental issues uh, in whatever domain, but it's also about changing the business models really the, the green economy, it's, it's not a you know, kind of hype word, it's, it's a reality. Global markets are changing, all the investors, all the clients, they are demanding and want sustainable business, uh, business uh, businesses to work in a sustainable fashion. If you're, if you're export oriented, not only working on domestic market, it's a must. You have to do it and it will bring along also the uh, positive environmental changes through that pressure from uh, export markets. But obviously, uh, you need to complement that with other policies as well. So I would say the carrot and the stick, uh, as they say in English, uh, was there. Definitely the EU uh, joining uh, pre-accession processes and, and joining was a very fundamental. Can you go back a little bit? So, so the EU accession meant that we had to kind of revamp or, or get our legislative uh, requirements all to the European level, uh, meaning introducing several new kind of limitations, regulations uh, in place. And, and this puts a strong pressure again to change the practices in business sector as well. And but it wasn't only requirements, it was also very strong uh, support, uh, financial support. Uh, well, throughout the 90s, there was a support from international donors, but we also had a benefit of kind of environmentally thinking neighbors. Finland and Sweden both provided assistance back then towards the environmental programs and, and the investments to create uh, 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 kind of environmental infrastructure. And, and then it, it was also in, in addition to that very important to put in place a transparent and well-functioning governance system because you can have the best strategies in the world. Strategy is important. It's important to think out what I see your focus is, how do we solve? But strategy is nothing without a good implementation. So you need to have the tools and organizational kind of setup for implementation. And I, I think Estonia managed to do that quite well. Next slide. So, so yeah, as I was saying, the, the, the carrot and stick part that, that uh, if, you look, if you look at the kind of histor historical development, then the early 2000s, this was the 
key time when most of kind of important legislative acts were introduced. Uh, and, and really, uh, there was a wide ranging then investments. We had several, we had uh, international donors, but we had FARA, we had LIFE, we had this Norway grants, uh, EU structural funds. But what was also important, Estonia introduced the national kind of own environmental taxation system. And these revenues went also back to financing environmental projects. So it was everything, water quality, it was the waste quality, it was the air quality, but it was also forestry, it was uh, environmental education and awareness. So there was a national fund uh, created, a national agency for environmental investments. And actually before SCI, I, I worked for four years financing these kind of solving environmental problems. Uh, yes, next slide, please. And, and the governance system, as I was saying, uh, you need good strategy, but, but even more so, I think you need a very good kind of uh, uh, governance system. So, so what Estonia currently have, has is that you have the Ministry of Environment that is responsible for creating the legal framework, you know, representing Estonia at the EU level, and then transposing the legislative directives and, and other uh, legal instruments into national legislation. Then uh, very importantly, you have an environmental board who is uh, responsible for permits and, and, and compliance check. Uh, and, uh, and there it's, it's also very important that we have now the system in place where you know, whenever you plan to invest into a new, whether it's industry or energy infrastructure that most likely will pollute, then you need to get a permit for that. You need to set out the parameters uh, within which you have to abide. And then you report every year uh, and, and you are being checked whether you comply or not. And then there's also environmental agency who is responsible for um, kind of monitoring, analysis, uh, doing the statistics, doing the, the, the air quality monitoring and the networks regarding that. And then, as I was uh, saying, uh, uh, also, I think a vital part of that system is that uh, there has been for more than 20 years now environmental investment center for which all these kind of grant programs have been uh, financed. Uh, uh, that has been, I think, very crucial for, for making the change happen. Because very many things, indeed, it's, it's uh, not realistic to expect that all the private households do the investments or the companies do the investments if, if, uh, if it's currently uh, cheaper to use the dirtier technology still. And, and if I look back, if I compare, for example, the case of Estonia, why Estonia has perhaps been in certain aspects uh, quicker through the transformation than some other countries who started from 1991 in similar position, or if you look at the Bulgaria or Romania or, or some other country, then I, I think the, that the commitment to the, that, that we work on expertise based, that we don't try to politicize every decision or politicize uh, kind of, I don't know, these funding agencies, that it expertise based uh, and, and really no tolerance for corruption working on that. If you look at the international rankings, Estonia is one of the least corrupt uh, of the kind of former Soviet uh, sphere. So I, I think this kind of that, let's set aside the political or, you know, who knows who, which is a, it's obviously, it was a thing in the 90s in a small country setting, connections always matter, but kind of the commitment that we will, you know, not take advantage of that and we will commit to the kind of expertise and merit-based system. I think this is actually also very important part why Estonia also has been very successful in implementing, for example, EU structural funds. Uh, 
Uh, and if you look at this, because not all countries can, uh, the lot of funding that EU gives to member states and those in the catching up and transition phase, and not all countries can manage to absorb and use these funds. They, they get, the pace is too slow. They get somehow stuck in a bureaucracy. But in Estonia, you see historically one of the highest rates again of the funds used. And I think this is because of that, uh, that uh, commitment. Can we go one slide back? Yeah, but, uh, just uh, to mention some of the things, perhaps this is of interest, how we tackle, because it was very much the air pollution in Estonia was related to energy sector and transport as well, but the heating part was, uh, and the electricity part was very big. So on electricity side, it was kind of enforcing the national requirements, uh, setting limits to uh, pollution uh, allowed, but, but then on a heating level and cities level, it was kind of really focusing on the district heating side, because this is what you can change and get a fast impact. So in most of Estonian cities by now, uh, the, all the district heating has been switched to biomass uh, and, and switched away from heavy oil or coal usage and also phasing out uh, gas. Uh, uh, and, and putting in place in modern technologies and then also improving the efficiency, uh, improving the piping because they, there were many losses. So if you decrease the losses, you decrease the uh, need for, for burning fuel. Uh, also improving the energy efficiency because again, the more energy efficient is your housing stock, the less you need to you know, uh, use primary energy to fuel that. Uh, but uh, also, uh, uh, also there have been direct, uh, not only district heating, but the house is not connected to district heating, like bigger apartment housing installation of modern either heat pumps or solar uh, technologies. Then there has been also to private households, different uh, investment support programs, but very often also linked to energy efficiency. And then on transport side, there has been kind of switching to biomethane buses. So it's local renewable fuel and cleaner than diesel. Uh, now there has been for in recent years, there has been also electric vehicle infrastructure creation, electric vehicle subsidy program. So historically that has been through different phases, but it all started out from really strong focus on, on district heating. But now over the last five years, there has been much wider range of programs also looking at industry, energy efficiency in the industry, because as you solve some of the big bits, then you go to the smaller sources of, of uh, pollution. But this is how we started out by taking the biggest uh, air pollution sources, tackling, focusing with the programs and legislation on them. And as these changes occur, then going to the smaller bits. But then I would say the next 10 years for Estonia, definitely an issue is rather a better city planning that you would have less of this forced mobility. If you have bad city planning or bad public services planning, then you have to drive your kids to the kindergarten or to school at the other end of the city or you know, commuting back and forth. And when you can you know, do the better planning of the services, then you start also cutting away one part, additional part of the uh, uh, solution. But this is kind of, I would say, the next uh, next challenges for Estonia. Next slide. And and next. So this has been the story of Estonia, and I'm really confident that if we could do it, you could easily do it as well. So I, I wish everyone uh, uh, success with it, and and happy to support it uh, if needed. Thank you. Hvala, Lauri. Uh, mislim da smo čuli jako... Uh... Thank you, Lauri. I believe we heard very useful information with concrete measures and focus on some of the very important elements in succeeding in improving air quality. And I'm sure that we can um, uh, use some of those, especially when you underlined that 
uh, you have an expert-based approach uh, and um, have a zero tolerance to corruption in this uh, sector. I believe we will have questions for Mr. Lauri as well. We can learn a lot from Estonian experience since we had the same baseline almost, but of course constitutional setup of Bosnia and Herzegovina is special and we cannot uh, completely copy your approach, but we can learn a lot from your approach. I would now invite the next panelist, uh, Mr. Christian Nagel, coming uh, from the uh, Austrian Environment Agency and to give us presentation called plans and measures for air quality improvement, uh, current good practices. We have QA questions already, and um, I will use this opportunity while you prepare yourself for presentation to tell them to pose questions under Q&A section. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, as Mr. Husika said, I work for the Environment Agency in Austria, and I'm also part of the EPPA, the Environmental Partnership Program for Accession Program, where Bosnia is also a member, and, and uh, colleagues from Bosnia took part in the workshops we conduct under the EPPA project. Um, and one um, workshop dealt also with uh, air quality directive and where we uh, where I presented uh, some thoughts about air quality plans and measures good uh, current good practice examples in Europe so next slide please so <coughs> I will shortly talk about some general considerations you already heard a little bit about it from or a lot from from Lauri and um, for my previous speakers, Eleni and, and Goran. Um, also interaction with climate measures is extremely important. And then some um, panels and uh, guidance documents on European level and activities of European institutions and good practice examples for domestic heating as this is an important source in, in Bosnia. But also awareness raising is important to really to push uh, politic makers. And finally, a little bit about traffic awareness raising, learning from the COVID-19 pandemic and also a nice project also for, from France about uh, it's for climate, but I think what we can learn from this project is valid for air quality as well. So next slide, please. Um, if air quality has to be improved, it's important, especially when we talk about particulate matter that we have an engagement and on all levels. So this is an example of Croatia uh, model calculations where PM um, um, PM concentration levels come from. So we have international contributions, we have national, we have urban, and we have local contributions. So all these different levels have to work together. For NO2 and SO2, it's mainly urban or local, but still many, the, the framework, the legislation is mainly often or most often done on the national level. So also here, the in cooperation is important. Next slide, please. We already heard about the importance of climate policies and these are largely beneficial for air quality. So a recent calculation for the European Union, for the 27 European member states has shown that if we implement strict climate measures on European level, so if we transform our energy system to, from fossil fuels to clean and renewable sources, there will be no further costs for air quality measures in 2050. On the contrary, we have a large 
benefit for, for air quality, for public health. Next slide, please. So some general guiding principles for, for air quality measures is that it's first of all, the emissions should be reduced at the source. So in, uh, in the factory, the vehicle should be cleaner, the, the household heating should be cleaner. The next step uh, of less importance uh, is that the concentrations should be reduced. That can be done, for example, by uh, noise barriers. And the least optimum or the uh, approach would be to reduce the exposure. So to tell people to avoid certain areas, to stay inside, or uh, to avoid busy roads and things like that. So this is certainly the, the least preferable option. Next slide, please. So overall, the guiding principles um, we have seen in the recent years to be important is that the pollutants, different pollutants like PM10 as particulate matter or sulfur dioxide, they should be tackled together. And it's important to cooperate with different authorities, uh, with neighboring communities to learn from each other. And, but measures should be certainly taken at that level where it's most efficient. And as climate change is a major driving force, it's important to have coherent approaches between all different policies, between climate change, transport, energy, noise, quality of life, so that always the same data is used and uh, uh, that the, the, the me measures don't contradict each other. Health data is important to find political support and in general, a strong political support and public support is important for the successful implementation as we have heard from the previous speaker as well. And indicators uh, to, to monitor your success for, for individual measures and for the overall plan is, is also an important uh, success factor. And one has to keep in mind that the main goal to improve air quality is to improve public health and not only comply with the limit value at a certain air quality monitoring station. And we also have to, to keep in mind that data will never be perfect. So, uh, but reduction of air pollutants is always um, beneficial for human health. So we can't wait until the data is better, but we can act already now. So next slide, please. Thanks. <laughs> um, so there's, as said, and we have already heard about some programs, there's a lot of uh, examples available in Europe. So what I will present is, is just a subject, subjective selection of some of this vast amount of material available. And it certainly is important that this is also the, what the workshop here is about to, to, to learn from the experience from other countries. And, it's also to, uh, important to see that really courage is necessary, that trials and experiments are useful tools. So failures are possible, but this should not discourage anyone from implement uh, measures and to try uh, different approaches. Next slide, please. So one uh, source of, uh, interesting material is the, the expert panel for clean air in cities, which um, is um, has been implemented under the UNEC Convention on Long Range Transponder Air Pollution. As people have seen that there are similar problems in many cities throughout the world. So for example, uh, domestic heating is a major focus in many cities and, and regions. Ammonia reduction helps also to, to reduce urban background levels and, and things like that. So next. So uh, and there has already been two workshops within these expert panels and all the presentations are available and you can find the links in the, in the presentation. Also another interesting 
program by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Um, the GRC is currently developing air quality management guidelines. So to, to summarize the existing knowledge, to identify key challenges uh, for different regions and cities throughout uh, Europe, um, and also to establish the link uh, between the uh, particular uh, uh, measure, then what, how are the changes for, how does this affect the emission of this uh, of a specific source and how does that change then the exposure um, of the, the population as this data is still in Europe also not available. So next slide, please. And so, and the TRC guidance document also tries to identify some key challenges that uh, um, many countries and regions in Europe face. So this is, for example, that the quantification of measures. So there are uncertainties regarding the emissions, uh, the compliance, when will we comply with the limit values, what are the health impacts. And also reliable scenarios and projections uh, for air quality concentrations, for emissions, how will they develop in future? It's not easy to get. And also source apportionment for particulate matter, uh, really to, to have a quite certain, so th this helps to identify the, the most cost effective measure. So for that, you need to know what sources contribute, how much to your PM levels. And also these guidance documents uh, try to cover some general is issues such as um, ensuring that there will be really a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. And so that uh, all the money that is now put into subsidies, that it this is used to really change our way of life towards a, a more greener and less polluting one. Next slide, please. So domestic heating, um, this is certainly a source that is often underestimated by public um, industry traffic. So this is uh, more often named as the major sources for air pollution, but uh, domestic heating, especially wood burning or coal burning is often underestimated, but also that the data quality is much worse compared to traffic. It's often not clear what fuel is used, how much of the fuel is used and in which um, appliances. And uh, further problem is that we have long renewal cycles of heating systems. And there's also a social issues because often uh, poor people have to use low quality fuels as they are cheaper. Some good practices are of course awareness campaigns because the, the operation of the of manual uh, appliances is crucial for the emissions. Maintenance inspection is also important. And if you ban solid fuel for climate change, it's better not to change to another fossil uh, fuel, but uh, shift immediately to zero emission technologies. Okay, next slide, please. And one nice example of an awareness raising program project was done by the steering colleagues who showed how the user can influence the emission. And for that, they built a domestic heating demonstration laboratory. Next slide, please. Uh, with which they went to small villages where wood burning is predominant and people could experiment with uh, different heating systems and install sensors to see what is the impact of different ways to operate the, 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 the heating system. Next slide, please. And they also prepared a an, an small uh, device and an, an um, um, smartphone app that the, so that the users can monitor the, their heating behavior and to build up a database and, and to see 
what is the impact if they change their behavior. Next slide, please. Um, another very interesting awareness raising program, which I think is also in general, awareness raising is important to really to get uh, public and political support for the implementation of measures. And so the, the participation of public and, and the stakeholders is key and element for success. And this is, I think, also uh, what this project is about. Um, and one of such an example is um, the so-called Curious Noises or the, the Curious Noses project in Antwerp, where citizens monitored NO2 levels with the help of very cheap uh, devices. And uh, that clearly gave a much better picture of the NO2 uh, pollution in Antwerp. And it clearly showed that the official data uh, did not cover some of the NO2 hotspots within the city. So next slide, please. Yes, thanks. <laughs> and one also one very interesting example is the French Citizen Convention on Climate. And, and with this had the goal, uh, this has the goal to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions to 40% until 2030. And what they did, they randomly selected 150 citizens throughout um, France. And this committee, this convention was supported by a governance committee, by technical and legal experts, by professionals in city participation and guarantors to oversee the neutrality and sincerity of the debates. And this uh, next slide, please. And this convention had seven sessions, so to, to inform the, the citizens uh, about the problem and then to, to find solutions and, and to finalize um, the study. Next slide, please. And in last summer, a uh, report was published with in total 150 general proposals, so very a lot of material. So the, this uh, convention was very active and covering traffic, consumption, housing, uh, work production. And I think the, the most interesting thing here is that the uh, convention came up with measures that were maybe thought beforehand it's politically not possible to, to implement such measures, but the citizen uh, thought that this is the, the most, uh, these are the, the most effective measures, so we will we have to implement them. And for example, such uh, such uh, measures are a general speed limit of 100 kilometers per hour on motorways and massive investment to modernize the infrastructure and end of domestic flights within France in, in, in four years time and ban of marketing of high emitting vehicles. So these are, I think, very interesting examples, which maybe politicians would not allow to propose. Next slide, please. And, uh, okay, this, uh, yeah, this is already, hopefully this is the next slide. No, yeah, previous slide, please, sorry. Pre I was not sure if it's already the next slide, so. Uh, and for also for housing and buildings, some the all boilers, all oil and coal boilers have to be changed by until 2030, to which is in nine years, in new and renovated buildings. And they also encourage to limit the use of heating and air conditioning, so less uh, to make the the rooms cooler during winter time and, and uh, less and warmer during summer time. To the, safe energy and also the development of peri urban shopping areas uh, which is an important driver for traffic and uh, so I, to summarize what what this approach has shown is that a well prepared and a well conducted process with clear objectives can really lead to very surprising far-reaching results next slide please 
So and what uh, the COVID pandemic has also already been mentioned and was what we can learn here is that uh, some measures uh, that are, have been part of air quality plans for long but never been really implemented were now uh, implemented very fast so to, to replace flight traveling by video conferences, temporary bike lanes with and also the start of the, the redistribution of public space to allow for, for keeping a safe distance. And of course, home office is much more widespread than it is before. But as I said, a green recovery will be crucial to avoid lock-in effects when we put all the money into the economy. Next slide. And one nice example maybe of kind of experiment to change public space was done in, in Vienna last summer where a swimming pool was built between very, uh, two very busy roads um, and to, to allow for a new view how public space can be used. Okay, next, yeah, <laughs> thanks. And also another interesting example is that uh, the, the mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, was re-elected in 2020 with a clear focus on ecology, solidarity, and engagement. So, and with a, uh, a far-reaching bicycle program and a far-reaching uh, program which uh, aims at giving priority for pedestrians instead of cars. Next slide, please. The same holds true for the Berlin Mobility Law, which was introduced in uh, 2018, and which was based on an um, initiative by one single person who wanted to shift the focus from the car-centered car mobility to an overall mobility. So the main elements are really to, to shift to, to a general view on mobility, to safety, to road safety, to inclusion and to quality of life and to redistribute the public space so that, all, um, that also the, the active modes of transport and the environmental friendly mobility has enough space in within a city. And finally, um, one example from Sweden, which is uh, in that sense of interest, as they made a framework for long term planning of environmental zones. So it was clear that when a city implements an environmental zone for vehicles above 3.5 tons, then until a certain date, which is uh, known several many years before, um, the owner of these trucks and buses are not allowed to enter the cities anymore. So this really helps to, to have a long-term planning, which is important for uh, commercial um, yeah, facilities. Next slide. Urban traffic, as said, uh, some general um, views on that. There's a European platform that provides a vast amount of successful examples of sustainable urban mobility plans. And we really have to think about shifting of the car center thinking towards mobility needs and promote active transport modes, which is good for health anyhow. A special problem are diesel vehicles as they are very dirty up to uh, Euro 5 when it comes to uh, nitrogen oxide emissions. So it's important not to use uh, the, the old vehicles that are banned maybe in some, Euro in some Western European countries and then import those vehicles and use them uh, within your country. Okay, this brings me to the, the final slide to summarize and conclude. So there's a large number of European national and regional examples available. Um, data gaps and uncertainty should not hamper the, the implementation of the measures. So you should not wait for the perfect data and citizen, also citizen involvement is important tool to achieve acceptance. And the COVID measures has shown that uh, 
change is possible within a very short period of time. And so, and this ongoing discussion about the redistribution of public space, which is, I think, important for air quality as well, goes on in many cities in Europe. Okay, thanks. And I only have to say that I have to leave uh, in 10 minutes. So if you have questions, um, uh, please um, ask them now or send me an email. Then I will certainly answer, try to answer your question. Hvala, hvala Kristiane. Vjerujem da je... Thank you, Christian. I believe that uh, other participants uh, were happy to hear the illustration of very specific measures and those uh, which uh, we uh, did not uh, have an opportunity to consider. Uh, Christian will remain for other and we are 10 minutes with late. us and uh, uh, the time for break is over. I should suggest that uh, we uh, ask questions to Christian and hear his answers and then we will have a short break of 10 minutes and continue our discussion until 11.30. Now, uh, I will I will try to let's go through we have summarize nine questions, uh, nine questions or see, see which the of these questions Christian. should be asked from Christian pertain to gender. We issue. have several questions regarding gender. Now so I would like to my ask uh, one question. general question and uh, ask Christian to answer. These uh, policies that were presented, uh, do they include EU gender equality strategy 2020-2025? Hmm. I have to say that uh, I don't know that for sure, but in general, I would assume that this is the case because in all European project that has to be considered. So that's sorry that, that that's all I can say. I didn't I have to admit that I didn't follow up on that. Thank you very much for your answer. If you could please uh, answer the next question. Next to which question. extent what are the were cases filed to the court the, uh, air, regarding uh, uh, air, air pollution, pollution at EU how level? Often how often cases uh, and the uh, courts the deal with the judgment? and if lawsuits regarding uh, air pollution, if I understood anyway. well the questions that we received mm -hmm. and uh, what were the, the verdicts in most cases? Uh, there are some ongoing cases against European member states for infringement of the ambient air quality directive. There have been already some verdicts um, <clears throat> against, I, I'm not sure, two, three, four countries, two, uh, two or four member states for breaching and extended breaching of PM10 levels or in the two levels and um, for not uh, having um, uh, an air quality monitoring network according to the, to the European directive. And, um, but as this is a, a three stage process, it takes quite a lot of time. It takes many years uh, until the verdict is, um, is, is, is published, uh, has been found. And um, so it's a, it's a process that might be, um, streamlined in, in future. But on national level, I think, especially in Germany, 
uh, court laws or uh, uh, this, so the, the bringing the administration to court helped a lot to, to foster the implementation, for example, of, of low emission zones in Germany. So this was a strong driving force, the lawsuits by, by different citizens. So it helps, but it's, it's a, it's a long-term process. Thank you for your answers. Perhaps uh, one more question we should share with you, but then, uh, as you said, you have to leave. The question is, uh, how uh, do you uh, restrict emissions from household stoves uh, in EU? And uh, do you uh, have any restrictions regarding uh, the height of these uh, stoves? Um, the, in Europe, all new appliances have to fulfill the, the so-called eco-design directive, the eco-design regulations so with certain emission uh, limit values. And then there are in those countries where it's um, mostly um, of, of most importance, there are then on top of national regulations for maintenance, for subsidies, for for inspections and things like that, or for example, as it has been in Sweden, for large scale uh, district heating, um, apply for district heating systems. And um, so these were mainly, so these, these are mainly the, the, the two approaches. And then there are, of course, are fuel quality standards, uh, not, uh, to do and um, but this is certainly a sector which is not that much regulated on a European scale compared to vehicles. So this eco design directive is relatively new, and before that it was mainly done on on national or, or local or regional levels. For example, such as in in Krakow where they implemented a solid fuel ban. The same for Dublin, where they, they implemented a, also a ban since I think um, 20 years already now. And so, but the second question, I, I didn't quite get that. Uh, what what do you do? The, the second part of the question, could you repeat that, please? The question was uh, if you had uh, cases of uh, limiting the height of new buildings in towns that the number of floors the height of buildings oh whew, good question i mean the i know that i mean this is regulated as far as i know strictly on on national and, and local level and i know it only from my hometown vienna where there are restrictions for certain areas. So in certain areas, only up to a specific, buildings can only be up to a specific height. Uh, but I'm, I'm not a specialist in that. So this is the, the only general answer I can give. Okay. Thank you, Christian. We wish you a nice day. And uh, regarding our webinar, I suggest that we make a very short break, shorter than envisaged, until 10.55, and then we can continue with the, our discussion. In the meantime, while we are uh, at the break, you don't need to log out and uh, you, you should remain linked and uh, you can send us question through Q&A box and please ask questions in our language. We have translation and uh, I would not like to interpret 
your questions. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll hear you again at uh, 10.55. Dakle, u ovom dijelu je predviđena diskus. Again, 10, 56. We are now for Q&A session under agenda. Thank you for posing questions in Q&A. We were able to answer some of them, and if I look through the questions, there is a discussion there, commenting the questions. And we have several questions posed and directed to us in charge of the developing of the environmental strategy. The first question is, there is a lack of monitoring network of air quality. I want to know whether the strategy will identify the need to adopt a methodology for defining locations of monitoring stations. We need to underline that in that segment, we use participatory approach, unlike traditional pro pro approach in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where experts write something and stakeholders then comment on it. In this case, we work uh, in a way that from the very beginning, all stakeholders and interested parties are included and involved and jointly create uh, with the leading experts, objectives, goals, and measures. So, in taking into account the identified issue, I'm sure that at the next working group meeting for air quality, we will propose a measure. So we identify the problem. The problem is that there is um, insufficient or lack of monitoring, a uh, lack of uh, network for monitoring of air quality. So this network needs to be uh, developed and that measure needs to be uh, defined uh, in participatory approach at our session. Also several other questions directed to us. Will this strategy take into account new goals identified in EU? I don't know which concrete goals you were referring to, whether that's the reduction of the uh, uh, pollutant emissions or GHG emission reduction, but as I said previously, it all comes down to the working group. The moderators, Goran nor I, can say whether we are going to take these goals into account in terms of quantitative reduction of emissions or improvement of an aspect for air quality. So I repeat, this is an issue to be tackled during discussion at the working group session. Also, another question that refers to situation Bosnia Herzegovina. Is there any progress in meeting uh, Bosnia Herzegovina 
uh, as a, uh, the top, which is um, conventioned on exceedance, at least on subnational level, probably referring to the entity level when they say subnational level. An additional comment say is very active in Sweden, so I really hope that in future we will be able to initiate some of the activities in Bosnia and Herzegovina as well. According to my information, um, I mean, it's relative what is what the progress is and what is not, but I can conclude that there is a no significant progress. Some activities are under preparation and we will see how to move forward. When it comes to other questions directed to us, I think that's it. And now we can hear other questions. I'll start with a question uh, for uh, Mr. Tamista. Says, during implementation of the energy efficiency measures in the housing sector and switching to cleaner heating technologies, uh, what was the support of the state in, in terms of co-funding of these programs, including the uh, funds from Estonia, EU, Norway, and similar, and how much citizens participate? You can give an answer also in uh, an average shares percentage, so whether the are the incentives by state were important in terms of accelerating the process of introduction of green technologies and improving their quality. It was a longer question, but I hope you understood. Floor is yours, Mr. Thomas. Yes, yep. thank you. If I understood correctly, and you were asking, you know, what was the percentage of the government subsidy, uh, then actually it was even up to 85% uh, of the total investment. It could vary uh, that in uh, some of the smaller districts, it was higher and in bigger district heating districts because the economies of scale and the efficiency was uh, higher, the, the share of support was lower, but yeah, it was kind of, it could be between 40 and 85%. So it was relatively high share of uh, support. Uh, uh, and, and it was uh, mostly directed uh, towards uh, companies, this district heating part. So district heating companies, most of them were owned municipally, so municipality, local governments own the heating, but in, um, uh, in the beginning, uh, but, but now most of those district heating uh, regions have been privatized and, and they are owned by companies. Obviously, private sector was more interested in starting from bigger cities where you have lots of customers and a good decent network. And, and mostly the problematic small ones these nobody wanted to buy, and these are these were managed by municipalities. Uh, and now, what is happening is that uh, now that most of the boiler houses have been switched, then actually, and uh, government started also giving uh, support from exiting from district heating. If you have only a very small municipality, you have a schoolhouse and four apartment houses. Nowadays, heat pumps and micro solutions uh, could be more efficient than keeping the lines where you have the energy losses. So it was a historically a different process that you started out with big subsidies for companies or municipality owned, and, and then started uh, going uh, uh, also uh, switching out the district heating. And then, then towards the kind of private citizens, uh, it, it was only later such programs started, but, but there have been uh, programs. But as I was explaining, they are very often uh, uh, related to also energy efficiency. And there the support has been, let's say, uh, between 40 to 60% of the total investment. Uh, 
Hvala. Hvala na odgovoru. Mislim da je poentirano I believe that uh, you answer the question. When it comes to other questions, and Mr. Lauri answered all the questions directed to him, but there is one that uh, refers to Estonian example. National gender responsive Did Estonia ensure national gender responsive mitigation uh, plan? Well, uh, I mean, being an EU member, obviously all the requirements and the kind of guidelines for putting together national policies, you know, we need to follow them. Uh, but I will say that's the difference between, you know, following the requirements on paper, and then if you are really good at delivering them. I would say, I remember, I started working in the Ministry of Economy in 2004, and there was already back then, there was questions. Does this program that you're planning help to you know, improve the gender balance, IT society, and the environment? These were kind of three, uh, three key kind of principles that you had to kind of evaluate each program or activity that we're doing and obviously there was some assessment hey how does it but it wasn't in depth and i would say there's now i think the eu level there's much more emphasis on seriously integrating these principles and i would say estonia wasn't very good i think on these gender issues because if you look at the facts estonia has still uh, high uh, wage gap, you know, difference between wage for men and women, it's, it's quite big. And it hasn't closed, Estonia hasn't closed the gap. So, so, so I would say, I think this is an area where Estonia actually needs to improve. Now for the, e, uh, for the programming for the 2021 and 2027, and our structured fund programs, Estonia is currently putting together the strategy. So, so it's a little bit kind of early to say how good Estonia is this time in terms of, of strategic planning, but, but I think in over next four months, Estonia should present the plan and then we can see whether how well it is integrated or not. But I would say so far, uh, it has been not very good. Hvala, hvala na odgovoru i na elaboraciji. Thank you for your answer and elaboration. And the next question we just got also refers to Estonia. So uh, let's use your presence with the mic on, Mr. Laudi. In percentages, uh, how much nuclear uh, plants uh, participate in production of the energy in, in Estonia? Uh, zero. So Estonian uh, electricity, what is important, I think, for Estonia is that the biggest change has been opening liberalization of energy market. This was one condition when we joined the EU. It was condition we open our energy markets and number two, that we connect to our neighbors. So Euro European Union financed building new interconnection to Finland. And, uh, and, and then in 2009, Estonia joined the Nordic Baltic power market, meaning now we have all the Nordic countries, Sweden, Finland, uh, Norway, Denmark, and Estonia and the Baltics, Latvia, Lithuania interconnected in electricity markets. And this was a uh, huge, because now we can rely on energy trading. We don't have to have all the capacity domestically. Uh, and, and, and what is important now, what Estonia benefits from the uh, low carbon and relatively cheap energy from Nordics, like hydro power, like nuclear in, in Sweden and Finland, and, and lots of wind from Denmark and, and Nordic countries. But, so this is one part was that integrating power markets, 
tremendous change, hugely important for decarbonization of oil, but also locally what has changed. We started out 100% producing electricity from oil shale, which you remember very dirty. But government introduced uh, uh, renewable subsidies in 2007. And what happened was that Estonia had the fastest increase of renewable electricity production in the whole European Union. And now what happened, 2007, we started. And uh, actually 2016, Estonia already fulfilled 2020 goals. Estonia was the first EU member state, one of the first to meet 2020 targets in terms of uh, share of renewables. And what that allowed was actually to sell our elect uh, renewable st statistics to countries who are not meeting the targets. That's the electric kind of statistical transfer mechanism in EU. So Estonia benefited economically. We sell sold for more than 100 million euros statistics to Luxembourg and other countries. And we invested that revenue again into these programs, energy efficiency, you know, better street lighting, all this kind of environmental friendly. So kind of cutting the emissions fast, created economic income. So, so, so multiple things, increasing re renewables. And now the next, uh, we had just a new government in Estonia starting in January. And in their co coalition agreement, now they said that they want by 2035 to stop electricity production from fossils. So not 2050, but 2035. Uh, and uh, for that, they want to kind of make Estonia offshore wind hub or, you know, center. Because now there's a kind of racial competition between Nordic and Baltic countries, and the government wants to push for for building that the offshore parks would be connected, big parks, kind of 1,000, 2,000 megawatt parks would be built in Estonia, and they want to kind of create the framework for that. So, so for years and years, it was like, oh, EU is forcing us to do renewables, but now government is saying, no, this is our economic strategy. We want to do the renewables because it's also employment, it's also jobs, it's also export. Of, of clean energy. So there has been a mental shift of thinking. Hvala, Lauri, na obsežnom odgovoru. I mislim da... Thank you, Lauri, for your detailed response. And I believe that from your answer right now, we can draw out conclusions and lessons to be learned for Bosnia and Herzegovina, because in baseline terms, uh, we um, are the same as Estonia were at that time, and we can have development through decarbonization and uh, we tried to use a statistical transfer mechanism in Bosnia and Herzegovina and we can use that because we are a member of the energy community but we did not manage to do so yet however I hope that with the experience from Estonia uh, we can further discuss this topic. When it comes to other questions, we have another one in the meantime. I would ask to ask Eleni. This is the question also posed to Christian, but I want to hear Eleni's opinion as well regarding the um, limiting emissions from the household furnaces. What is your opinion, especially in the region, when we talk about the Western Balkan countries, but not only them, but um, East Bloc countries? Do you have any experience in terms of urban planning and limiting the new construction, uh, any limits to the new construction and how you do with the construction in the new urban centers. Eleni, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so with the, with the countries that we have engaged with so far, this is something that appears as a priority for them, um, I would say overall, but it, it can be prioritized in a, in a different way. For some countries, it can be very high, uh, a very high priority and a very, very immediate priority, but also it is something that some countries can act quite fast on, provided that the 
that the frameworks are in place, that the infrastructure is in place, and that the, the dialogue between the stakeholders, the different stakeholders, has already happened. Um, in other cases, it is part of their immediate plans, so um, or their future plans, as I was as I was showing you in the timeline. Sometimes this is something that they will be targeting for 2025. This is something that they might have to push uh, uh, back in time or even work on sooner. But I think that it always depends on uh, the national context. It, it depends on the national priorities and the the advice of the experts, um, the needs, the the social needs that need to be covered. And, and what the country is ready to put in place. So it, is, it, it always appears as, as part of the mitigation options, as part of the, the solutions. And we always need to consider and assess um, what is best, which is what we do through the communication and the collaboration with the, with the national experts. Thank you. Thank you, Eleni, for your response. I think there was another question. And this was also Estonian. Example, Estonia raised so much interest, and this is about funds, Mr. Lari said that Estonia used Norwegian funds, and this is the question related to that. How much Estonia used Norwegian funds, and which one, and can BNH apply for these funds, Norwegian funds? This was the question for Mr. Lowry. Mrs. Lowry, sorry. Yes, so I was just trying to look up some numbers on the website uh, about the Norwegian funds. Uh, for example, in the last uh, uh, period, uh, you know, this is the European, this uh, economic area program that Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway have to fund uh, because they, they want to access the European economic area. And I'm looking at the number, for example, for Estonia, the total funding was 68 million euros uh, in 2014 to uh, 2021. So it's quite significant. And, and I remember that, uh, you know, these countries that are funding programs, they usually in cooperation with the member state then uh, define the priorities. And, and for Norway funding, I remember the priorities were like, like IT and digital innovation and the environment, and, and then kind of, uh, you know, sustainability and uh, social issues. So I would say, I don't know exact, I don't have the exact numbers, but historically these have been, you know, tens of millions going into environment. I, I remember that, uh, quite a lot of this monitoring and environmental kind of assessment type of kind of infrastructure was a significant part of that uh, uh, Norway grant. Thank you. We have uh, several questions we need to address. In the meantime, we received uh, one suggestion that uh, a ESAP project should take into account the results in, of the project uh, uh, which is implemented in Bosnia and Herzegovina regarding air quality. Thank you very much for this uh, suggestion. And uh, we also suggest that uh, this uh, should be proposed uh, to the working group for air quality. Another question. Uh, uh, in, indicated that the strategy should contain very specific timelines. Uh, we did not uh, highlight this, but those who participated in the meetings of the working groups previously are aware that the strategy also will contain the action plan with defined 
uh, objectives, measures, and timelines, deadlines. That was uh, for the purpose of uh, explanation. But the discussion took uh, the direction of uh, discussing the energy balance of Estonia. The question is uh, how much energy uh, Estonia is producing and how much it is uh, importing, just percentual percentages. Because now it is market-based, this can change from year to year. For example, in, in 2016, 17, uh, Estonia was producing more than we consumed. So we were exporting, we were selling energy to, to Latvia and Finland. But in 2019, electricity production in Estonia decreased by almost 40%. So we started importing and this was because the CO2 price and in emission trading system went up. So for years, the CO2 price uh, in this emission system was like three, five, six, seven, eight euros and so on. So it wasn't giving the price signal, but when it went to 20 euro, then oil shale electricity in Estonia wasn't competitive on a regional power market. And now Estonia is importing mostly. And that is also one of the reasons why you know, government is understanding that there's no economic future for oil shale electricity. We need to start investing into wind parks and solar and, and clean capacities because then we would have energy for ourselves, but also for selling at the Nordic power market. So, so really it depends on CO2 price and a little bit also kind of you know, outages, for example, if there's a, a big, big nuclear capacity going out in Nordics for maintenance, then oil sale is competitive to fill that kind of gap. But, but other than that, it's, it's very CO2 price driven now. Thank you, Lauri. Let's uh, get back to the issues of air quality. Uh, there is one question for Eleni to this end. You mentioned an interesting example from Athens regarding the improvement of air quality, the initiative. And what this is uh, one problem we may have here with the involvement and engagement of the public. How can we obtain the support of the public for the measures that we decide to implement? Uh, could you please give, give us your perspective and your experience on this, uh, especially regarding some measures such as uh, limited access to some parts of the towns or then on uh, motor vehicles in some part of the towns, uh, uh, our, our population is very reluctant to support such examples. Thank you. Um, I would like to connect the example of Athens to another example um, in Bristol. So I'm, I'm currently um, living in Bristol. Something that I don't think happened to the extent that it should have happened in Athens was early engagement with the public and early consultation with the public. So in, in Bristol, when the, the mayor was developing the, uh, the clean air strategy and the, the, there were plans to start implementing uh, pedestrianization of roads and uh, new cycle routes, uh, new bikes, more bikes, um, and this change in, in how we drive in the city and how we live in the city, there was, there was a, a very long period of consultation and it was extremely inclusive in the sense that there were representatives from all the groups that, that live and experience the city. So there were student representatives, university representatives, um, representatives from um, marginalized communities, minorities, and this dialogue really helped map and identify issues that every 
team, every, every member of the community, or at least to the extent that it was possible, it helped identify those key issues that the, the different groups in the city uh, would, uh, would experience. It was, um, it was important because they were the ones that would be um, implementing the change, the, this, this type of participatory design that then leads to the behavior change, that then leads to uh, changing how we, we walk in the city, how we move in the city. It was important to map and identify from the beginning. And, and, and this did happen. And I must say that the, it's, it's very different when, when I compare this to Athens, because in, in the Great Walk um, occasion, the, the project itself was rolled back. But we've had other occasions in Athens where other measures were implemented, for example, the electric bikes or the um, electric scooters. Um, this was implemented in another city as well. But the, these measures, they did not have a long term effect. They did not have a long term impact. And that comes with an associated cost behind that, because if it is not taken up by the public, if for whatever reason the public thinks that this is not appropriate, to them or for them. This is something that the experts need to know. This is something that the policymakers need to know. And this is something that needs to be addressed in the best way for the local context. So I genuinely don't think that what happened in Bristol and the type of change that happened here could have been imp implemented in Athens because our, our culture is different. Our way of engaging with the city is different. So. This is why I wanted to share that with you, because while the, the multiple benefits of that, the, you know, the, the health, the cycling, the environment, the air pollution, these can be understood and these can be communicated. It is also important to understand the circumstances of the citizens who are experiencing the city and are engaging with the city in their everyday lives. And I think Bristol did a very good job in, in mapping that and, and including that into their plans. Thank you, Eleni, for your answer and explanation. We have three minutes until the end of the official part of the program. We don't have uh, any questions in the Q&A box. If uh, anyone has uh, any questions, you can ask them now, but as a moderator, Perhaps uh, I should also address the issue which we did not tackle, but from my experience, I know that this is a critical issue in Bosnia and Herzegovina when it comes to air quality, and these are human capacities, capacities that the institutions have, the institutions which are responsible and which should deal with these issues. On one of the slides, Lauri showed the, the, the list of institutions which in early 1990s uh, started to work on the implementation or, or on, first on designing and then implementing the measures in this area. So to this end, the question is, just approximately how many people, how many persons do you have who are directly responsible for improvement of air quality? And how do other sectors contribute to this? How do you involve the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the Ministry of Traffic, uh, and how do they help the agencies uh, which have the primary responsibility in this uh, sector? Please, short answer. Was this question to me? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So I would say, uh, you know, Estonia is a small country and that is both a minus and a plus. I think the big plus of being small is that you have to be kind of uh, fast and uh, you have a small network. Few key people, if they cooperate well, then things start happening. Uh, 
but you have small resources. I would say people, if you look at the ministry side, there's a, the Department of Air Quality, I think it's less than 10 people. And they do EU legislation, local legislation, funding programs, national strategies. So less than 10 people. I, I, I was the director of energy department in the Ministry of Economy. I had eight people to do national energy policy and EU policy and all that. So, uh, and EU presidency, you know, <laughs> Estonia held uh, 2017. So, so, and then you have, I think, for example, uh, environmental board who is doing the permits and supervision. I think there you have also kind of 10 people additionally, and then environmental agency uh, who is doing the monitoring and analysis and statistics and so on. There's, you know, five to six people. And then at the funding agency where I also work, we had 90 people for 10 areas of kind of, you know, managing, controlling, payments, you know, compliance, everything programming and yet let's say again less less than 10 people for funding of air quality related projects so it's you know you have to do fast and i think important part was technology estonia is very good at e-government solutions you know if you do smart kind of systems where you can online fill in reports from companies you know re regarding your if you're doing the permit applications, not on paper, but digital, if you're doing the funding applications, everything is digital, you know, you don't, we didn't accept any more on paper applications for projects. So, so this speeds up and you can do with a smaller amount of people. Uh, and now there's also machine learning, artificial intelligence, who can do the checks and compliance. Online, it doesn't have to be people, but rather the machines and algorithms are checking and saying, hey, something doesn't add up in the numbers, please look manually on this application, for example. So these are the things that, you know, if you're good people, smart design and, and good use of technology, you can do already a lot. You don't need to hire 500 people to implement it. I think if you hire 500 people, you're moving more slowly because then people start inventing jobs for themselves or you start having coordination problems. And, and then cooperation with other ministries. It was a problem, definitely. I think in the 1990s, in the beginning, everybody was, was focused to create the system out of chaos. You know, there was nothing, zero. <laughs> there was no, you know, kind of organizational structures, legal basis. So everybody was focusing on their stuff. But I think once the basics was kind of built, then it started, hey, but I, I need your help or I need you to change this thing. And, and in the beginning, it was hard. I think kind of Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Environment, they had very different views perhaps on these issues. But I think uh, kind of it takes time to start. Uh, and, and also then there was created, for example, uh, uh, administrative coordinating structure. Prime Minister's office created kind of coordinating top officials body and they discussed everything kind of when the, there was a problem between ministries, they uh, tried to solve it kind of top uh, civil service level. So it's a, you know, it's a process, uh, but yeah, I, I think there are kind of few simple rules that can help a little bit. Hvala, Lauri, na vrlo korisnim informacijama. Thank you, Lauri, for this useful information for us, for Bosnia and Herzegovina, for all the levels of government. Professor, we have uh, three hands raised, and I would like to suggest uh, the, that uh, the technical support allows them to come forward Perhaps they uh, were not able to write their questions in the chat box or question and answer. Ms. Dushica Pesevic, I would like to give her an opportunity to ask her question. Ms. Dushica. Ovo 
uh, perhaps this was an error. Nirha Kozica also raised the hand. Ms. Nirha, if you have a question, you can come forward. Nothing. They probably pressed the sign accidentally, but we don't have any more uh, requests. This was obviously an error. Thank you, Nadira. Everyone had an opportunity to ask their questions through Q and A or chat. We tried to answer all the questions. Thank you very much for your participation. At the end, we have 104 participants. At one point, we had uh, 115, and we are happy that uh, we had uh, such a great outturn. At the end, uh, I can say that uh, we heard a lot of good examples about the general approach to improvement of air quality and a lot of specific examples. Although we are more or less aware of uh, specific measures that can be taken, it's difficult to concentrate everything in one webinar, but we learned a lot how we can, uh, what approach and methodology we can use to obtain the support of general public and other sectors. And the answers to question showed that the example of Estonia is uh, very useful. And uh, I believe you will agree that in the development of this strategy and beyond we will help we will uh, use the help and advice of those who developed the strategy in estonia and who achieved uh, impressive results i will use uh, this opportunity to announce the third meeting of the working group uh, on air quality in late March. And uh, I invite all of you to attend this meeting. And I hope that uh, everything we heard today and we, we discussed today will give an added value to the next uh, to the participation in the next working group meeting and all future meetings of the working group and that it's, uh, this will make you take uh, uh, active uh, participation in the development of the strategy. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice day.